On this episode of Moi TV, it's me, Col Gray. I'm Laura's cocktail correspondent on the show this week, and we're sharing some stories from our careers. I mean, we did the sums, and Laura and I have a combined total experience of 35 years. Woo! That is a long time. Let's begin with a quick introduction to you then, Col, for anybody who doesn't know you yet. If you're building a career as a creative pro, and you're curious about this industry, then stick around because Laura and I have some choice stories to tell you. I mean, I've got a few years on Laura. I think uh, this Gandalf length beard tells that story. So I've been running my business, Pixels Inc, for 16 years now. And I also have a YouTube channel called Rock Your Brand, which I've been running for five years. And Laura's gonna put a link to that up here and also down in the show notes. I cover all the things from brand, branding, brand identity, and graphic design. So if you like Moi TV, be sure to check it out. And don't forget to tell everyone how we met as well, Carl. Yeah, that's a good story to get going. We actually met at a CMA event in Edinburgh. That's the Content Marketing Academy, which was started by Chris Marr. Um, and I absolutely loved that event. In this particular year, I was one of the speakers. And if I remember rightly, Laura, you sent me a funny video for that. And there was Buckfast involved. We totally hit it off that year and uh, we even went clubbing later on on one of the evenings to my favourite rock club in Edinburgh called Opium. Yes, that's right. And a quick tip for anybody actually who's planning a night out in Edinburgh, make sure you wear flats. Leave the heels in the wardrobe back in the hotel. Trust me. Now we could each sit here and tell you our long backstories, but I think whilst that might be really interesting for us, it kind of takes away from the aesthetic principles that I'm really striving for here with the Cocktail Correspondent segment on Moi TV. What do you think, Carl? I totally. I'm not one to detract from solid aesthetic principles. I mean, one of my favourite parts of Moi TV is the cheesy cuts. Oh, you mean these types of cuts? That's right, Laura. Now over to you. Back to you in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we got a little bit distracted there. <laughs> so as I was saying, I really wanted to maintain my aesthetic principles with the cocktail correspondence segment, but I really want to make sure that you guys get all of the best bits of mine and Cole's 35 years combined experience. So I've invented a quick drinking game. In fact, I love it so much that I've decided it's going to be a permanent evolution to the cocktail correspondence segment here on my TV. To begin with this, I've posted you a little pack of cards in the post, haven't I, Carl? Did you get them? Yeah, the cards arrived today, so let's uh, open them up and see what we've got here. All right. Oh, that's uh, some sticky gum we've got on these cards. All right, okay, so... Moi to you. Woo, I'm glad they've arrived. <laughs> now, it wouldn't be a drinking game if we didn't have a drink. So why don't you go ahead and tell everyone at home, call which cocktail you've selected to pair with your cocktail correspondence. Well, today, Laura, I've mixed a painkiller because I love dark rum and calories. Whoa. Let me tell you how to make this. What you need is you need a tall, high glass, and an eco straw, a cocktail shaker filled with fresh ice, a nutmeg grater, and the ingredients, two ounces of dark or navy rum, four ounces of pineapple juice, one ounce of orange juice, one ounce cream of coconut, pineapple wedge for garnish, and a whole nutmeg, which you'll grate later just for that spicy garnish on the top. And to mix it, you just pour in the rum, the pineapple juice, the orange juice, the cream of coconut into your shaker. Give all a really good shake up, like a death metal blast beat on the drum. Strain it into your iced highball glass. Grate some nutmeg on there. Add your wedge of pineapple garnish. Then serve and enjoy. I love dark rums because I've got a really sweet tooth and it totally scratches that itch. Mm, mm, mm. You cannot beat that spicy rum undertone that goes really well with the nutmeg shavings on the top. 
This one for me is like a little moment of tropical decadence. So cheers, my dears. Cheers, my dears. Okay, so the way that this is gonna work is you have five different cards there and on each of those five cards are five different types of story or um, different lessons that you've learned along the way as a creative professional to date. Every time you pick a card, you tell the tale with the lesson that you learned as a result of that tale. Or if you decide you don't really wanna go into it that much, you can forfeit it and get me to answer the question about my career instead. Okie doke, got it. Right, so the first card says, being a fresh face in creative, what not to do? Whew, it's gone back a few years now for me to kind of talk about where I was as a fresh creative. But one of the, one of the things that I find um, really probably hindered me um, in those early years from, from progressing um, and, uh, you know, getting probably better clients um, is pricing. And um, one thing that I would say is that you should do from the start is charge something. I see all the time people saying that they're doing stuff for free because they're trying to build their portfolio, they're trying to raise awareness of themselves, you know, so they can attract customers and clients. But by charging nothing, what you're doing is you're kind of sending out a message that you're, what you're doing isn't worth anything, if you see what I mean. And so I think it's really important that it doesn't matter what you charge. It could be anything, just a nominal, minimal amount, so that the person that you're doing the work for actually feels like they're having to make a transaction rather than you just doing something for nothing. If you do something for nothing, then it's gonna get harder to charge later on. And even though I have said, you know, charge whatever you want, charge minimal, I would say that you do need to really think about where you wanna be and what level you want to be. Don't do what I did, and, and I had this habit of assuming how much money people had to spend. And so I would arrange my pricing uh, based on what I thought someone could afford. I don't know how much money someone has, and so the best thing that you can do is for you to decide how much do I want to do this job, and then you charge that amount. And by doing that, you'll then be able to set, you know, the precedent of how much uh, your services cost. And that makes it actually easier for you to level up your pricing as the years go by. If you start off on a free level, then you start charging very little, you're going to build your early reputation on being really cheap, which then makes it hard to leap out of that reputation and charge more. So. If I could go back myself, I would certainly be charging a lot more when I started um, uh, to make it easier for me to, to level up as I go along. So hopefully that answers uh, that first question, Laura. Wow, what a great tale. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Are you ready to do another one? You betcha, Laura. Okay, let's go. Here's the next card. Okay, so this card says, collaboration, complete nightmare, or creative sparks, right, okay. The obvious thing would be talking about, you know, collaborating with other designers to help you get through projects. I personally think that's an obvious one, and I would say, you know, if you are going to collaborate with another designer, what I found is that, yes, you want to collaborate with someone that's good, but you really need to find someone that's like-minded. That makes it working together so much easier, um, you'll have much more fun Fun is a key element for me and when I'm working. Uh, and you know, you don't want to be too stressed out because if you, if you start working with someone who is not like-minded, then you get personality clashes and one person takes the lead and it's, it all gets a bit awkward. So find someone whose work that you like and then have, have a few conversations with them. See what they're like, you know, get to know them a bit before you make that commitment to working together and splitting the fee or however that works. For me though, collaboration um, is about collaborating with my clients. I always want my clients to feel like they are part of the project. I know that some designers basically take the brief and will just go away and do everything and 
deliver the final thing to the client and say, here's what I've done. That's fine, that works, that totally works. And there'll be some clients who want that. They just don't want to be involved at all. And in saying that, when I speak to my clients, if I have a client or they would be a lead at that point, if a lead comes to me and wants to hire me for my services and they don't want to be involved, they just say, no, I'm too busy, uh, I need you to just do this, then generally I will probably say that client isn't the right fit for me. I do want the client to be involved. I'm not asking them to draw things, I'm not asking them to, you know, do too much homework, but they need to be involved and want, you know, I want them to be interested. Years ago, I've done so much work for clients who just weren't interested. They saw design as something that was just needed to be done. It wasn't a necessity. It wasn't a part of their business plan. And I felt like, you know, I wasn't needed. And it was a horrible feeling. And so in these days, I make sure that the clients that I work with are as engaged in the project and as excited about the project as I am. So for me, collaboration is about working with clients who really value what you do. I value their time and together we can create the best possible outcome for them. Oof, that is incredible. I'm gonna have a little sip of my painkiller. You take your time to pick your next card. Okay, so on to the next card. Right, so this next card says, burnout as a creative entrepreneur. Now I'm gonna tell a tale about this, Laura, and I want you to tell your tale about this as well because it's a really important topic. I suppose it's a bit like uh, when they're sharing their scars on Jaws, you know, when they're on the boat and they're all telling their stories. So I'll kick off and then after I finished, we'll hear from you. <laughs> I love that idea, really good idea, Paul. Let's run with that. You tell your bit first though to get started. Burnout obviously uh, happens when you're working all the hours, you know, burning the candle at both ends. And I think definitely in the creative industry, we all do that. We are all people pleasers and we will bend over backwards to make sure that the client is happy um, and we give them the best thing that we can. We put our heart and soul into everything that we do. And it can be torturous when the client just doesn't get it and they're asking for changes and making you amend things and it can get really, really tiring. When I'm feeling really burnt out, I just get so tired and I lose all motivation. I lose all creativity, spark. I just, everything just goes meh. And I, oh, it's just, it's just horrible. It's not the best feeling ever. What happens is projects start to pile up. You leave things to the last minute. You don't feel like you're doing your best work, even though, you know, the work is probably still good. You're just not really feeling it. Then you're not presenting your best self to your clients. You're probably not great to be around uh, for family. You know, I get grumpy, maybe a bit more grumpy than usual. Burnout's a terrible thing for anyone. Um, and we're all under a lot of pressure to, you know, be doing all the social media stuff as well as running your business and, you know, cr providing great content. It is just overwhelming. I still, I still suffer from it. I still, I'm, you know, I'm not immune to it, but I'm getting better at making sure I give myself time, downtime. And it doesn't have to be a lot. Um, it could be just half a day, you know, every week or a full day every couple of weeks. Uh, ideally, you want to try and claim your weekends back, you know. Do try to get into a Monday to Friday. It's even harder when you work from home because you have no set office hours. You just be like, well, I can do work now or not work now. When I feel like I'm about to burn out, I just go, right, you know what? I'm taking this, this half day. No one's gonna die. And if you've got good clients, they will be understanding. Um, and you just say, look, I'm not available that day. I'm just gonna chill out. I'm just gonna do what do what I want. Work will, will be there. I know there's a temptation if you're, you know, you're a creative and especially if you're a freelancer that you need to be working all the time to bring the work in and bring the work in. But from my experience, as long as you're giving yourself the time to recover and be fresh minded and, you know, creative, then you're going to be able to create the content and the, you know, the designs that will attract new clients and it will come in. So be kind to yourself. Laura, I'd love to hear from you. What's, what's your experiences of burnout? Well, thanks for asking. I've actually got a few different stories about this topic, to be perfectly honest with you, as it's definitely something I've managed to get myself embroiled into over the last nine years as a creative entrepreneur. 
I'm going to give you the headline. So these are the headline of all of my different Jaws-like scores. And this can be surmised in the following list. Are you ready? Okay, let's have a drink because this is a little bit scary to share. I now know that when I'm about to hit ultimate burnout, I'm probably going to get quite a serious case of laryngitis. So I lose my voice. That's happened to me a number of times in the last nine years. And it's always a good two weeks, maybe three, completely out of work because I literally can't get any words out. I developed sudden adult onset asthma a few years into running my business and that actually resulted in two weeks in hospital and now I have asthma for the rest of my life. After I was recovering from the news that I had asthma now, I also developed a very rare brain condition called idiopathic intracranial hypertension. That's abbreviated to IIH. Thank the stars, this is in remission, but it is something that affects a lot of other health issues and it's something that I'm gonna have to deal with and manage for the rest of my life. I think a lot of people don't realize that a lot of truly professional creatives are ultra aware and very sensitive to the stereotype that creatives are lazy, never make deadlines and never really get a good job done. And when you're ultra sensitive to that particular stereotype, I think it's really easy to overpromise. You wanna be the one creative professional who completely shatters that stereotype once and for all. But when you overpromise over and over again or at multiple different times to different sets of people, you paint yourself into a corner. And I don't know about you, but this is definitely the case for me. If I've said I'm gonna do something, it's gonna happen, whether that means I don't sleep, whether that means I have to cancel like major family events, I make sure that I meet that promise because I'm ultra aware of this creative professional stereotype. And the result of that, of course, is that over time, this starts to have health repercussions like the ones I've just listed. Each one of the medical events I've just listed out there has been quite a significant wake up call for me to listen to my body and go back to putting my health first. But if I'm 100% honest with you right now, now that I've had a few sips of painkiller, this is something that I know I'm gonna continually have to work on. It's a challenge I'm gonna face over and over again. I am much better at planning my time. I am slowly getting better at trying not to kill myself to meet crazy demands. And I really wanna master the art of under promising and over delivering instead of the other way around. Carl, you are one of the biggest people pleasers I know, and I think it takes one to know one, right? So tell us, do you think you handle burnout triggers a bit better than me? Oh, how do I sort out my people pleasing? Uh, it is one of my biggest downfalls. I do want to please everyone. But what I have to do these days, thanks to some mentorship that I've had from a few coaches, I need to switch on the business side of my brain, uh, which is a side which doesn't switch on very often. But when I get to a point where I start to maybe get a little bit stressed about, you know, a proposal or, you know, a client's asked me for a deadline which I feel is maybe just not workable and is going to, you know, really not be good for, for the outcome of the, the project or my health, then I switch on my business brain and say, right, is this helping me move my business forward? And is it a good business decision? And, you know, not just for me, but is it going to help my client's business? And if the answer is no, then I just have to say no. By consciously going, I am in business mode, it helps me from just bringing in the people pleasing, yes man type thing. Um, I, don't, I don't do that anymore. I just go, right, is this, a, this is a business decision. So let's be, you know, logical and fair and make the right choice here. You know, when I'm in people pleasing mode, if I say no, I feel guilty. It's like, oh, I'm letting them down. I'm not doing what they need. But if you, if you, if you think about it like a business, you are helping them because by saying no, you're not delivering um, an underprepared, underfinished um, project where you're giving less than you should. I think you should really keep that burnout question for all future cocktail correspondence, Laura, because I think it's a really important issue. It's really interesting to find out, you know, how everyone else experiences that. And I do think it will also help 
all of us, especially creatives again, with imposter syndrome, to know that we're not alone and that we're all kind of, you know, dealing with the same problems, but we can find out, you know, from others how they deal with it and we can maybe implement that um, ourselves to combat burnout, future burnout, so that, you know, we are more relaxed and enjoying ourselves in our chosen chosen sector uh, in the creative industry. Let's move on to the next question that you sent me and see what we've got. Okay, so this next one is giving newbies a leg up. And because you chose to have me tell one of my tales, you have to tell your tale about this one. So fire away. The design industry as a whole is seen seen in a different way from, let's say, an architect. Um, and I'm talking graphic design here. It's often seen as a throwaway thing and it's not valued as much as, as some of the other uh, creative industries. And a lot of the time it's a race to the bottom on price. You have got sites like 99designs and Fiverr. Now I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna rail on those. I think they, they serve a purpose. But for me as a brand designer, you know, logo designer, brand identity, those sites are really damaging to logo design as a, as a niche, I suppose, in the design world. Logo design takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of research um, and a lot of preparation. And when you see people offering it, you know, for like Fiverr, you know, uh, 10 quid, 50 quid, even 100, it doesn't do our industry justice. Now, you're always going to have people who won't want to pay much and that's fine. That's how it works. But what I wanted to do was, in terms of giving newbies a leg up, now I can, you know, if I had people come in as, as an intern, I could do that on a one-to-one -one basis. But I needed a way, or I wanted to kind of maybe try to reach out in a wider way, uh, help, you know, as many people as possible from my experiences. And I suppose my YouTube channel is a way of doing that. Now I actually started my YouTube channel to help business owners, new business owners and existing business owners with their brand, but it very quickly uh, became apparent that there was a lot of younger designers, people, I say younger designers, there are many people who get into design who are not young. Uh, so let's say young in their career as designers were following my channel and taking part and asking me questions. And so it was great to know that, you know, my content on my channel was was helping my industry. And by that, what I mean is if I can help give people who are early in their design career more confidence to charge more, to um, stand up for themselves more, uh, show them how to attract better clients, uh, how to promote themselves, then overall that will hopefully, you know, make the design industry improve. And I know that there are other designers out there on YouTube and who have podcasts, blog writing, who are also doing the same. I'm not in a vacuum. I'm not doing this on my own. There are other designers out there, more experienced designers like me, who are trying to help younger designers get that leg up and get a good start in their career, learn from the mistakes that we all made. I mean, a regular comment that I get on my YouTube channel is that people are learning more from my videos than they learned when they were at school or college. So, you know, there must be something there that is, uh, you know, that's worthwhile. And I just want to say that I am just about to start doing actual mentoring for younger designers because I feel that part of my purpose um, is to teach. I love teaching. I love delivering workshops. Um, and so I've decided to make a conscious effort to make teaching a part of my business, a service offering that I give. So, uh, so hopefully that answers that question for you, Laura. You are sharing so many helpful lessons today. Thank you so much for this. Why don't we go straight into your last card? Yep, I am ready on this one, Laura. This is it, the final card. Dun, dun, dun. What does it say? Just going for it as an independent creative professional. I suppose one of my biggest regrets, if I have one uh, about my design career, is leaving it so long to, to go out on my own and start my own you know, my own business and be in charge of myself uh, and what I do. For some people, they just have no 
inclination to be a freelancer uh, and they would rather be an employee and that's great and I would actually recommend that even if you're self-taught so if you're self-taught um, or you are fresh out of college, art college, art school, whatever, I would highly recommend that you try to get a job inside a design studio. You will learn a ton. You will learn so much from working as part of a team and learning from people in that agency who are, you know, who've got more years on you uh, and can pass down the knowledge compared to just going out there on your own and kind of fumbling around and trying to figure out business and marketing yourself and, and all of that stuff, it's really difficult. I did work in a few studios uh, before I went uh, solo, but I probably could have gone solo uh, a lot quicker than than I did. But if you are, you know, just wanted, you know, wanted freelance, just go for it. I know it's scary, especially if you're maybe in a job right now and you've got that monthly income coming in and you're like, it's set and you're like, I know how much money I've got. One of the things about going freelance is, ooh, it can be a bumpy ride. You know, some months you make, you know, good money, other months you don't make any money. So you have to make sure you keep money saved to, to weather that. You do want to try to bring some things in to, to even that out, whether that's affiliate income, some passive income, you know, even it might even be if, as you start freelancing, you might need to get a part-time job just in a supermarket or something, just to bring in a fixed amount of money to take the pressure off of the bills a little bit so that you're not panicking too much. And it will be scary. And to be honest, you might try it and it might not work, but it might just not work because you're not ready at that point. So don't let it, you know, derail you from ever starting your own business or from ever going freelance just take a step back maybe get another job again whether that's in design you know or like i say a, a job anywhere just to bring some money in work on you know your portfolio one of the things i will say is build your own website if you're promoting all of your stuff on behance or pinterest or any of the other portfolio sites they can change at any time or they could disappear at any time. They may just decide we don't want that anymore and they'll pull it offline. You need your own website because that way you are in control. So make sure that you build your own website with your portfolio, saying what you do, what your skills are, uh, case studies, testimonials, um, and that will really, really, really help you. And on the back of starting your own website, also start to build an email list. Any inquiries you get, you know, maybe start a little newsletter or, or have, create a lead magnet, you know, a useful piece of uh, information about design, you know, uh, top tips for, for clients who have a new business and gather email addresses because they, that will become very, very valuable and it lets you communicate directly to people who have been interested in a service that you offer. I think that about covers that uh, last question for me, Laura. I am incredibly grateful that you've taken the time to do a little bit of creative jamming with me so that we've evolved this segment a little bit. It really does help to bounce ideas off each other. I've been your host, Laura Perman. And I've been your cocktail correspondent, Cole Gray. If you're interested in brand, branding, brand identity for your business, or maybe you're a designer who's interested in learning more about that, why not join hundreds of other brand rockers and join my monthly bulletin email, which is called Rock Your Brand. And you can join that at rockyourbrand.co.uk. If you've enjoyed learning about our experiences as a creative pro, then you should check out these two episodes here on Moi TV. Thank you, Colin. Mwah. Mwah. Now before you go anywhere, don't forget to subscribe. Mwah.